John, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. My name is uh, John Wise. I have been a philosophy professor all of my professional life. Um, got my PhD at the University of California, Irvine in 2004. My dissertation was on Jean-Paul Sartre um, and his connection to the German idealist tradition. I became an atheist when I was in graduate school. And uh, in 2019, I succumbed <laughs> to the wiles of my wife and turned my life over to Christ. I mean, that's the, that's the, the narrative that um, I think is going to be uh, common um, given my um, experience and my story. Awesome. Um, there's a friend of mine, Doug, he's a, he runs a YouTube channel called Pine Creek. He says that he has the Pine Creek's theorem. His theorem is that uh, more women have converted men than apologetics. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, but I am an atheist and I've been an atheist for, I don't know, 15 years now. And as an atheist, I don't believe there are any reasons to genuinely believe that there is a higher power or a God or anything. I think the natural world probably explains everything that there is. So could you tell me um, what are your reasons for converting to Christianity? And do you think there are objective reasons to believe in Christianity? That depends on what you call objective reasons. Yes, I do believe so. Um, because I think everything in human rationality points beyond this world to something else, something that's beyond the material reality that we find ourselves in. Like what? So what do you mean by rationality? Well, I think, points I to... think human rationality itself is um, a manifestation of the divine. I think that we have structured into us the divine spark that allows us to actually do something that the animals don't do. And that's look beyond this, uh, this world of a material reality to an ideal world. It is what science is founded on. It is what mathematics is founded on. We don't just anchor ourselves to this world. We look beyond it, or we couldn't really try to even understand this world. Why would that be indicative of, if you said, like, connected to the divine spark or something along that line? It seems like yeah. that would be a natural flow of evolution that through imagination, we try to envision a greater acquisition of the particular resources that we value. And so I don't see, like... I don't see a problem with imagining that if a chimpanzee or a rat or something was to evolve further down the line, they would be able to use their imagination to project into the future and imagine that the moon is made of cheese and the mouse can just live on the moon of cheese. I imagine that would be highly likely, and I don't think it would require a divine spark to do that. It seems like a natural flow of evolution to lean towards those kinds of thought patterns once you have a high enough cognitive capacity. Yeah, except that uh, the whole idea of rationality forces us to search for causes and the causes keep pushing us back until we encounter things that we can't understand and that doesn't mean that there's a reality beyond that but it does mean that we as human beings are actually searching for something that is outside this world because when we think of mathematics there is where do we get this sense of unity from Unity is a single thing, but we don't encounter unity in the world. Unity is a transcendent concept, as is plurality. Because in the natural world, all we have is this stream of our experience. I don't quite understand what you mean by these ideas lead to something outside of this world. So I agree that we're looking for causes and the causes always lead to like a, a regress of some kind. And we don't know what the fundamental nature of reality is. I totally agree with you there, but I'd say that to posit a fundamental nature of reality hypothesis, like quantum fields or string theory or something seems far more plausible an explanation than a divine entity or a mind of some kind outside of space time. Why does string theory or quantum fields um, contradict the notion of a supernatural reality? Well, the hypothesis says there is a string theory. There is not a God. So like if we take that hypothesis that the well, fundamental wait. nature of reality is X and it's a string theory and there is nothing more fundamental, which would rule out a God versus the hypothesis. But, but then that where does the string come from? 
it was uncreated. So each okay. of them is a All right. fundamental uncreated thing. That's fantastic. So we have one of two options. Either things came into existence in space and time, or we have an uncreated reality. Both of those things point beyond our immediate understanding here oh, to sure. something that's beyond us. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, I definitely think well, that, that that thing that's beyond us, I call God. Well, would you say that, because I typically define God as a conscious entity of some kind that has created every all other things, something along those lines? That's fine, but that's a derived understanding. That's something that we've built up since the fundamental thing. I mean, since the fundamental realization. What we're doing when we constantly seek as human beings to find the causal reality is we keep pushing it back until we hit mystery. And then we can't resolve that. And you yourself just said, it may very well just be uncreated. It has existed for all eternity. Okay, start there. That's a good place to begin. And then start building on that. And I think that's a fundamental reality for human experience. I think that all throughout history, human beings have encountered that. And that's why the notion of God is present in every human culture throughout history. And it has not been expunged from our own culture, despite the fact that we've been living in a, an age of extreme skepticism. God still remains a viable way to understand, even if, you know, there's also a viable way to disagree with it. And I think atheism is rational. I've thought that, I mean, I couldn't have become an atheist myself for 25 years if I didn't think it was a rational position. I don't think it's the best position. Well, so now I'm slightly confused because atheists also agree that there's a fundamental nature of reality. I don't know of any atheist that doesn't think there's a fundamental nature of reality. And so if we got, we define God as just- I agree with that too. Well, yeah, so but if we just define a God as a the fundamental nature of reality, it seems like in your past statement, there's two different usages of the word God here. One is that the, the general fundamental nature of reality, and one is the more mind-related thing in society. Um, right. There are some societies that definitely don't have that. Like Jainism has no conscious fundamental entity. Buddhism doesn't. Um, atheism doesn't. Uh, the Praha people don't. There's lots of societies that have a fundamental nature that isn't conscious. And so what I want to distinguish is, is it rational to believe that there is a conscious entity that created the universe? Or is it more rational to believe it's nature, a non-conscious entity? And to me, that's how I define theism versus atheism, God versus not God, is I'm contrasting the conscious entity hypothesis versus the unguided natural forces hypothesis. Okay, but that leaves us with the question, what are these unguided natural forces? From whence do they arrive? Where do they come from? And unguided implies that there's no rationality present you're saying rationality is a derivative phenomenon, yep. but I don't think rationality is a derivative phenomenon because we see rationality structured in the entire universe. All of these things are incredibly complex from the atom to, you know, spontaneous pair generation and, and, and what is it? Spontaneous pair generation and annihilation. These oh, are uh, yeah, virtual particles. At an incredible level of structure. I mean, this is, this is why, someone like Hegel, who was, um, was an immanentist, found it so important to build rationality into the structure. And when I look at the world around us, and I say, I constantly get pushed back to these fundamental causal things. And when you yourself just said, there's some basis at the bottom of it that is uncreated, if that's where we start, then that is something that we don't have access to that's transcendent to us, but that is, is um, it's either rational or irrational. And if it's irrational, where does rationality come from? There's that spark of the divine. So there's a couple of things there. One is I think that most atheists, I think we could potentially have access to the fundamental thing. Like I think quantum fields, we have access to quantum fields. We can interact with them, make predictions. And so the I don't think that whatever a the fundamental field. nature, what? A quantum field, perhaps, right? I mean, we're examining, we're examining these things, but we're examining them from extremely limited temporospatial 
slice sure. of reality of the whole of reality sure. and somehow we were trying to claim from that basis that we can understand the whole of reality and that's i think a dangerous thing to do i'm not sure about that but i'm just like i think it's possible that we could interact with the fundamental nature of reality and be right so like say we we could meet a god god could come to earth and talk to us and it, at which point we would literally be interacting with the fundamental nature of reality and i think science is the same way we could be interacting with quantum fields that are the fundamental nature of reality even if we don't need to know everything about them it's possible that the the higgs field or whatever is the fundamental nature of reality we can't prove that we, we won't be able to know everything about it but it's possible that's it that's the final frontier and so i, I wouldn't I have no disagreement with any of that okay so, so, so i'd say it's a problem with that all right me neither me neither so my point is just that it's possible for us to interact with the fundamental nature of reality i wouldn't I think, say that whatever the fundamental nature of reality is that it is intrinsically beyond us i'd yeah, say we, I, there's no reason to think we couldn't potentially discover whatever it is no the, you're absolutely right i think we are interacting and that's fundamental to my own belief system that we are directly interacting with the fundamental reality gotcha. but that our picture of it is inevitably partial and that no matter how hard we strive, we're never going to get the whole picture. Right. So I'd probably lean towards agreeing with that. I wouldn't say it's impossible. Never say anything's impossible because whenever people say that, it's proven wrong in the next decade usually. Yeah, there are a lot of things like that, yes. But I I, I just don't think from um, the, the limit. Sorry, I'm, I don't know your background. I, I The only thing I know about you is I watched one little video in which in which you were combing your hair while one of your guests was talking. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> thing I know about you. So I don't know anything about your background. Um, but oh, if you, um, you're free, feel, feel free to ask if you want to learn sure. more about me. It's totally fine. Sure. So, it's so open, so open dialogue. Sure. Socrates was huge in, in my, uh, my evolution and understanding of all of these things. And I think Socrates got it right. And he was originally, when I started teaching philosophy, um, one of the villains of my course. And I came to absolutely adore Socrates because he made us all realize how fundamentally limited we are. And as creatures inhabiting one infinitesimally small spot in space time, it, it, it makes it impossible for us to get the picture of the whole. I think uh... being limited as a human being is the very nature of being human. And so to say that we can interact with God may be true. In fact, it's what I believe. I believe that all of our interactions at some level, and I'm not trying to be pantheistic here, but I think that all of our interactions at some level are interactions with God. Because as Paul said, in him we live, move, and have our being. I mean, that's the fundamental structure. The name Yahweh means I am, right? The, the great being itself. And so I think that's fundamental. But to claim that we can, by those limited interactions, grasp the whole, I just don't think that's possible. Right. So I would agree. So that was the only part I was disagreeing with was you said that the fundamental nature is beyond us. And so I, I think we can interact with some degree, but not necessarily the whole. I would agree with you there. But then I wanted to move on to the part where about rationality and irrationality. Now, I think rationality is a language like math or English. It, we can use it to describe things or to understand things. But it's not like rationality is required for the thing to exist, which seems to be more like what you're implying, that the quantum field or whatever, it it follows the laws of logic. It is what it is. It's not what it's not, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, this requires some rationality to cause that to be the case, which I don't think is true. I think that is, I don't re see a reason to infer that because we can describe something with logic, logic must exist to cause that thing. Right. I don't, I don't I disagree with that. I think, I, as I said, I think atheism is a rational stance. It's a metaphysical stance, but it's a rational stance. And I think you can be a materialist. I just don't think materialism adequately addresses the human condition. I think that's the part I'm asking about, because when you're talking about uh, whatever the fundamental nature is requires rationality. I don't understand why, because to me, it seems rationality is like English made up by human brains to describe things. I don't see why rationality would be required or entailed for the fundamental nature. And could you tell me more about what you mean by it, sure. materialism doesn't describe the human experience or something like that? Sure. Um, so when I was an atheist, in fact, I, I don't know if you saw my um, discussion with uh, David C. Smalley. And we so, talked yeah. about... We're friends. 
What's that? Oh, good. Yeah, good. I like David. And yeah, I, so guy. far, I like you too. You seem like a good Thank guy. And you. I appreciate you, you know, I appreciate the rationality that you bring to this. Um, it, it is important to talk about these things. So I I appreciate it a lot. Now, um, what was I going to address? <laughs> um, so I off on a tangent there. So I asked specifically what's the first thing you said rationality would be uh, required in the basis of the fundamental nature of reality. Right. And I said, I don't see why. And the second thing was you mentioned that materialism, atheism, right. you said doesn't accommodate or explain the human okay. experience or something along those lines. Got it. That Thank you for the reorientation. Right. Um, so what I have a problem with there is then you're making rationality into a derivative phenomenon or an epiphenomenon. Um, rather than something that's inherent in in the actual structure of the universe. I get it. That's a metaphysical position. You can believe it. But then I encounter this world with this, this um, derivative phenomenon that is somehow just derived from the requirements for me to exist as a creature in the material world and somehow or other, that derivative epiphenomenon matches up with the natural world and with the mathematical structure. And the reasoning is so dead on that it seems to actually allow us not only to pursue truth, but actually to, at some level, achieve it, to find it. And that absolute level of truth that science, no, okay, absolute is bad level, bad language. That, that approximate truth that we keep pursuing in science seems to get better and better and closer and closer to the real reality that's there. And it, 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 can you not see some disparity between that fundamental ability, that spark, what I call the spark of the divine, that allows us actually to make sense of the world in such a way that the world actually mirrors that? that the two are matched together, that the natural world not only seems to be rational, but when we investigate it, it actually comes back as though our rationality is matching up to the world in such a way that, you know, the science that we're doing has been prefigured in the mathematics that came long before it, right? Before, before we knew about the quantum world, we developed the mathematics that would allow us to understand the quantum world. And those two matched up long after the mathematics, right? So sure. the, the experimental evidence seems to be saying, wait, there's a sort of fundamental structure here that we're grasping with human rationality. And that fundamental structure matches the rational. And that seems to me a puzzle. Well, for me, that seems like, uh, take English, for example. Um, if I say the sky is blue, that corresponds to reality. And if someone says the sky is purple, that does not correspond to reality. And so if we imagine 50,000 years ago, somebody says the sky is blue and somebody else says the sky is purple, uh, um, we would aggregate towards the one that more accurately describes reality. And I think math works the same way. Math has gone through many iterations. We didn't even invent zero until the past like 500 years or something. Um, and so math didn't always describe reality they were incorrect maths they were things that were wrong and they had to be changed to more yes. fit reality mm -hmm. and i think english is the same way and so i don't see it as some kind of magical thing where uh there's some inherent built-in truthiness to math and logic or english it happens to be the case that we make those correspond to reality and we adopt them because they respond to reality better than an alternative version. But we're just making lots and lots of different versions of these things. Some of them work, some of them don't. And the ones that work, we pick those. And then we have different variations of those. And the ones that work better, we pick those. So like we had Newtonian gravity, uh, F equals MA, the, the gravitational constants that Newton had couldn't explain the perihelion of Mercury. And then Einstein came along and said, ah, I like this one. This one works better. Space and time bends. Completely crazy. Doesn't make any sense. But hey, it, the math works. Uh, yeah. And so because that one better described reality and he made predictions about like the curvature of light around the sun that were more accurate than Newton's. We said, Oh, this, this version of math is better. The Newton's versions of math is wrong. And so language seems to have three categories of sentences. Um, those that describe reality, like one plus one equals two, or the sky is blue. Those that do not describe reality, like F equals MA times 47, that does not describe reality. Um, or like, um, 
I am seven foot four does not describe reality, unfortunately. And then there's the sentences that are like self-contradictions. One plus one equals five, or um, I'm a married bachelor. And it seems like all language has these three facets of kinds of sentences that can exist. And of these kinds, we try to take the ones that describe reality and selectively pick the ones that are closer and closer to describing reality. And so I think this, from my perspective, fully explains the phenomenon of math and logic in English more accurately describing reality as we subsequently move on. I don't think it requires some kind of truthiness connection beyond human nature or evolution, which is, seems to be what you're implying. Well, then is, is truth constructed? Sort of. So truth is a property of sentences. I don't think truth exists. So like if I say, is that table true? Like, no, the table is not true. That doesn't make any sense. If I say the sentence, does the table exist? Well, that sentence is true, but the table isn't true. There's no like truth in the table anywhere. And so okay, from but, my perspective, truth is a property of sentences that describe reality. And if the sentence describes reality, then the sentence is true. But the table, the objects aren't themselves true. No, but the, the connection between your your um, your reasonable faculties and the table expresses a notion of truth because either it, and I mean you've made the case already that truth is something that we work towards and when we find failures in our mental representations that don't match up to reality then we must allow reality to correct our mental representations this is the process of science. It's the process sure. of living in the world. So, but there are metaphysical things too beyond that. There are assumptions that we make. And all that you've given me here is the assumption that there is no connection. And that's valid. I get it. I understand it. I held that view myself. Wait, wait, I'm on a little bit because I think there is a connection. I think like the sentence for a sentence to be true, it has to describe reality. So I think there is a connection there. I'm not sure. Like, I don't think truth is inherent in the object but i do think truth and sentences do have a connection mm -hmm. yeah there's being in the object yeah. and 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 our and our mental representations of it language i mean but language isn't the only way that we relate to things we see the objective thing itself and we 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 get to know it better by examining it looking at it but we never even in the most basic object have a full representation of all that it is Right. The, I mean, you know, Kant, I, I already can tell you're, you're well yeah. philosophic tradition. There, there are infinite ways of approaching any object and each one of them will give us other aspects of its objectivity, its reality. And if, if we examine it infinitely, it's going to, we're going to find out that even the smallest things have an almost infinite aspect to it. And that's as a result of the fact that we are so incredibly limited in our perspective like if we could gain the universal perspective that someone like hegel wants to claim then we might indeed be able to grasp everything as the enlightenment rationalists wanted to but that's forgetting the fact that we are incredibly limited human beings located in one small spatiotemporal moment well, sure, sure. I think I would agree with all of that. I agree that we have a limited perspective and I agree we don't have an ability to grasp like omniscience and gain all knowledge, but I don't see how that would imply that there is something more to rationality than just a byproduct of our minds to describe reality like English. I don't see any sufficient difference between English and rationality or math. Um, and so I don't see why we would infer that there is this, that you're holding, why you're holding rationality in this greater esteem than English and not just granting that it's just a product of human but mind. But English is, English is a product of rationality. I mean, it's, it, you're, you're, you're making the case, I think, that language is dispelling because, because language is a complex phenomenon of reference, that it's dispelling the, the pointing beyond itself to, to that which is beyond this world. Um, and I just don't think it manages to do that. It, it manages to say, hey, this is a derivative phenomenon if that's all there is are derivative phenomenons ph phenomena excuse me but I, I think the position that these ideals that we hold as rational individuals have an existence beyond what is around us is another metaphysical assumption that contains at least as much plausibility and for me a little more plausibility than the the starting point where there is nothing beyond this world
and everything is a derivative phenomenon. And I think the case really is stronger that um, rationality is something, uh, something unique in our experience. And our, to go to language for just a second, we as human beings constantly use this notion of artificial versus um, natural, right? And natural is that which has not been messed with by human rationality. And so we have, as a culture, adopted this thing that all that is natural is good, but all that is artificial is bad, right? And that's, you know, I, I know I'm overgeneralizing there, but we make a fundamental distinction between that which has been messed with by human rationality and the natural world. And so there is a pointing beyond the natural in just that. I'm not sure I would agree with that definition because for me, artificial would be by definition derivative. So if it's artificial, it's derivative because it was made by a mind. So obviously it can't be fundamental if it's artificial because it was made by some other thing. So that seems to be what artificial is denoting is that it's uh, not a necessary being. It's a composite of some kind. It's a contingent on some agent. Contingency, and, yes. And so I would say that rationality and logic and math and English are all artificial in that they are contingent on a mind. Okay. Um, so let's pick I, up on that contingency. Sure. Because contingency is that something is, but it could have been otherwise. And why is there you, you, the fundamental question of metaphysics? Why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, um, it, and I, I get it. You can go back to the everything is 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 eternal. But if everything is eternal, then that that's that eternal thing can stand in for God as well as anything else. It's a starting place. All right. So I would agree with that point. But again, when I say God, I mean a conscious entity. And that's the part that I think is not rationally justified. I think granting that there's a fundamental thing is completely rational. I think that is, I don't think you can't, I think not doing that is irrational. Saying that there was literally a nothing and then something popped out of it. I think that's irrational. Like Hegel. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Lawrence Krauss. <laughs> um, well, yes. So I think that we have to start that there is something. Um, and I think that's rational, but I don't think it's rational to infer from that something that it has a mind because i think that would be like saying it's a pineapple or something i think that of all the material things that we know about there's a hierarchy uh, it's like quantum fields physics chemistry biology brains minds and so to infer that there is a mind at the fundamental nature of reality seems about as rational as to infer that there's a pineapple at the fundamental nature of reality taking an object that is at the bottom of that hierarchy no, because a pineapple is irrational and what we look around and we see at the universe around us is this incredible structure that mirrors our own rationality. And that mirror is contingent itself. It's like, why is that the case? And I think it's rational to look beyond that. What The only thing I object to um, in, in the statement that you just made is that it's irrational to think that there's something beyond that causes this. That would that would um, uh, destroy almost the entire structure of, of human reasoning before us because almost everything, every, every culture, as I said, look beyond the immediate to something else. And that's just, the, I mean, Aristotle himself, um, one of the most fundamental, uh, important um, philosophers in our culture, um, traced everything back to the unmoved mover. And if I may, just one more thing. Um, you're, you, you seem to be objecting to the notion of just calling that God. But if that's a starting point, right, if that's a basic assumption, which is what I'm saying, it's a place to start, then the entire process of investigation, just like we do with science, is a process of trial and error, trying to understand this fundamental being better. And so the notion of God is going to change as we investigate and learn and understand. And then as things progress, we start to understand that this being, this fundamental being, is also rational or is also personal. And then we come to understand more things as we move along through history about this God that we're investigating. So, so my only claim is that to think that the necessary fundamental nature of reality is a being that is conscious, that part I think is irrational equally as much as to think that the necessary being is a pineapple is irrational. I think they're irrational for the same reasons. 
Now, I don't think it's irrational to think there is a necessary being or that there's something beyond our current known stuff. Obviously, I agree with both of those statements, but I don't that the one claim I'm making is that it would be irrational to claim or to believe that the fundamental nature of reality is a conscious entity. That part, I think, is irrational. Um, you know, something else that seemed incredibly irrational um, uh, that that Einstein called spooky action at a distance um, is 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 the idea of the quantum entanglement. And yet we allowed reality to correct our mental views of these things because reality is fundamental. We have to look at that and that has to be the thing that corrects us. And sure. I think that that's the point of of theology, the attempt to understand this being that the world is around us. All right, so and, I would agree perfect. I would agree with everything there. I think that you, um, to make something rational, you have to confirm it with evidence. So I think believing a spooky action at a distance before we confirmed it was irrational. Nobody should have believed it until we had no, evidence. No, it wasn't irrational. No, um, because it, it, it actually fit a rational scheme that Einstein had in place, and it violated that scheme. But it wasn't irrational. It was it was a complete expression of a rational position, but it was a rational position that needed to be corrected in the right in, towards reality. Well, so I think like if suppose there was no evidence for it yet, but Einstein obviously had a model that made successful predictions. And so that model has evidence. But prior to that, so say there was no models, no evidence that, that nothing there, then it would be irrational to believe this because it's based on nothing. So yeah, but what makes something rational is if there is a justification, some kind of evidence that supports this conclusion, um, then it becomes rational. And without that, it would be irrational. Even if you believe something true, if you had no rational justification, it would be irrational to believe that thing. And so my question is, what is the rational justification for believing that there is a conscious entity, the fundamental you, nature of reality? Sorry, I missed the last part, but you actually said something there that that it's like if if it's if it's irrational, um, oh, sorry. I, I'm, so, so what I, I said was, I if there's clicking my mind, and now I lost it. Um, so I said, if there's no rational justification for a belief, it's irrational to believe it. Yes, but you're already assuming rationality there. Um, sure. Uh, and and one of the things you wanted to say about rationality is that it's a derivative phenomenon. Sure. Um, and so uh, it, how can you be judging the nature of the rational with something that is not itself rational? Uh, well, my I mind... Mean, rationality seems to be something that... You, what you just said there, you seem to be making rationality into an absolute, and yet you're calling it a, de a derivative phenomenon. Uh, I'm not sure I follow. So my epistemology work says conceptual claims require conceptual evidence, empirical claims require empirical evidence, metaphysical claims require metaphysical evidence. Conceptual claims are just anything you imagine, anything in the imagination. So rationality is conceptual. So if you want to make a conceptual conclusion about rationality or truth, which are properties of sentences, then the only thing that's required is conceptual evidence, which is um, logical consistency, which is also conceptual. So epistemologically, you don't need any of those to be fundamental to have a logically rational conceptual conclusion you just need to be able to imagine it um, and then have imaginary justifications for why then you have a conceptual conclusion like i am imagining a unicorn my imagination justifies the conclusion that i'm imagining a unicorn therefore i don't actually need this to be fundamental it's just a product of my mind perfectly fine um and so rationality right. being to, the product to, of my to mind actually the find a unicorn would would be the only way that you could actually declare that the unicorn was real you have to find it in reality Empirically. So if I'm making the yeah, claim that exactly. a unicorn exists in independent of my mind, now I need empirical evidence. But exactly. if I'm only claiming I'm imagining a unicorn, I don't need empirical evidence. Right. So if I'm only making as long a claim as you're aware it's an imagination. Right. So logic and math and English are just imaginary. And so I don't need to empirically find those things in the world or think they're fundamental. Even if they're a composite or a contingent thing, for them to be justified, they only need to be in my imagination. Okay. But if you're going to, if you're going to have knowledge, as Kant said, you've got to have both. So you have to have the conceptual and the conceptual has to meet with the empirical and then you've got knowledge. But if you, if you just have the conceptual, then what you're essentially doing is 
thinking about things. And then you've got to determine whether or not those things that you're thinking about actually line up with anything. And that's the, don't the process of science. So, so like it, I classify knowledge in different categories. You have conceptual knowledge, empirical knowledge, metaphysical knowledge. And so to have conceptual knowledge, you don't need any reference to reality. Conceptual knowledge just means you imagine it. So if I imagine a unicorn, then I have conceptual knowledge that I'm imagining a unicorn. I don't need empirical verification of this because I'm not making a claim about... No, you have an imagination. <laughs> I mean, yes. you have an image that you've painted in your head. That's not yes. knowledge. Well, it's knowledge about that image. It, okay. So, it's, so I have it's knowledge that you have knowledge. an image, yeah. but, but it's it's not okay. So this is a definitional issue. You're you're defining knowledge as any any. Um, so you're you're doing the phenomenological thing. Any, uh, well, I define any, knowledge as a JTD. That, anything that I represent in my mind is knowledge. Well, I define knowledge as a justified true belief, and so if I have a belief about a conceptual thing, like I am imagining a unicorn, since my belief is only about a conceptual object. The entailment of the belief is only conceptual. It doesn't entail that such a unicorn exists externally. It only entails that one exists in my mind. And because I'm imagining it, that is a thing in my mind. Therefore, I'm justified in believing that it is true that I have a imagined unicorn in my mind. And so if the entailment of the belief is only that it exists in my mind, then I can have a justified true belief about that thing in my mind. Therefore, I have conceptual knowledge. Um, now, if I'm making a claim about the world would exist independent of my mind, then I would need the external verificationism of science to be justified in believing that thing. But if I'm, my only claim is that there's something true in my mind, one plus one equals two, I don't need the external verification to be justified in believing that or to have knowledge of that. It is purely where, a conceptual truth. Where do you live? Uh, Minneapolis. Oh, it's Minneapolis. I wish you were closer. Um, <laughs> I would have a lot of fun talking with you. This is... This is actually stimulating at a level I haven't had for a while. So thank um, you, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. This is this is good. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to all of that because, in in a certain way, um, you're 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 presenting things that I haven't thought about um, fully, and, and therefore I'd need to clear more clearly understand um, the positions before I could comment on them. It's the best that I can sense. do. With that. I, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that makes sense. That's a perfectly rational thing to say. Thank you. <laughs> I try to think I'm I'm rational, although I'm married, so I find that <laughs> oftentimes I'm not. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I thought you were about to say, well, I'm married, so clearly that was an irrational decision. <laughs> oh, oh, no, that was the most <laughs> rational thing I've ever done. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, from my position, thinking that a conscious entity is the fundamental nature of reality, I wanted to go back to my analogy of the, the pineapple and explain to you why I believe that those are equivalent statements. Um, I think that based on the evidence we have, pineapples only occur after biology, which only occurs after chemistry, which is after physics, which is after quantum fields. And so to think that a pineapple could exist prior to quantum fields would be irrational because we have no way to with within the things that we know exist, understand how a pineapple could potentially exist prior to these prerequisite foundations that are necessary for it. And it seems minds are the same. To have a, a mind, it seems to require space and time, which requires those things to form chemistry and physics and biology to form brains. And then brains are the things that seem to produce consciousness. And so without these prerequisite materials, it seems irrational to think that there is a conscious entity prior to the fundamental nature of reality because to have a conscious entity you need all of these prerequisite things okay but then 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 you're starting with the assumption that material reality is the only reality that there is you're already making the assumption that the only sort of conscious being is the sort of conscious being that we are so once again we're going back to the, the starting place where you're assuming an anti-supernatural basis and everything else follows from that well, I, I'm not I assuming that. I so I'm, I'm a moral realist, so I believe that there are those things can exist, but I think there's no evidence of them. So I think it's possible that there is another kind of a soul out there, but we have no evidence of that thing. And if we don't have any evidence of that thing, That's then it's do. not rational to posit that it exists. So like, I could posit that pineapples could exist in a supernatural realm and come about by a different way of physics that I just don't know about yet. But would that make it then rational to infer that a pineapple existed prior to the beginning of the universe? Probably not. Even though it's possible and we don't have any evidence that that 
doesn't exist. That doesn't, that isn't thereby evidence it does exist. And so for it to be rational to infer that a pineapple did exist prior to the universe, I think you would first need to provide evidence of that alternative realm and not just say it could be there. Because I'm not presupposing there is no magical pineapple realm, but because there's no evidence, it seems irrational to infer that there is such a thing. But the explanation of God covers the facts perfectly well. There, 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 I, I mean, you, you say it's something you can imagine, but those of us who have lived throughout history, who have adopted that metaphysical position, and it is a metaphysical position, um, through faith, and I think the only way to take a metaphysical position is through faith, um, then it's worked for us metaphysically. Reality has corresponded. And that goes back to the whole idea of rationality corresponding so incredibly tightly with the world around us that it's like, how does that happen? How does mathematics correspond so well to the natural world that we can actually have a way of describing the, the quantum realm before we even encountered such a thing as the quantum realm, right? So it's, there's, there's something about rationality that is so far beyond explanation that it seems to be a breakthrough into the universe of something fundamentally different. So, so it, it, it doesn't prove it. I'm just saying it points to it. Well, so there's a couple things there that I'm trying to grasp. Um, so I, I grant rationality describes reality very well, um, but I don't think that's m requires an explanation beyond us. That's the part that I'm I'm missing. Why would that require an explanation beyond evolution? Because like if we have say say we have a system of um, like you believe do you believe in evolution? Just to check. yeah, I'm I, I'm an evolutionist. Yeah. So evolution, the way evolution happened was that through natural selection, there were lots of mutations. The bad ones died off. The good ones continued. And this can create an extremely complicated particular set of things, which seem like just ridiculously levels of um, specificity. And so I don't see why we couldn't also achieve the same thing with rationality, logic, magic, math, et cetera, by using an evolutionary process of having a bunch of iterations many of them fail and we by getting rid of the failing iterations we can get a more particular more precise correct version just like evolution does with animals and so i don't see why the level of precision and accuracy of math could not be explained in an evolutionary way just like wings can be explained in an evolutionary way because math is fundamentally different from the the um i mean the conceptual understanding of math is fundamentally different from the evolved mechanisms of the world. What, what possible purpose does math serve to natural selection and the understanding of the world around us? Why, why did we need that? I mean, what, what possible natural selection would have allowed consciousness, not, not consciousness, um, consciousness comes with, with life, I believe, um, but could have evolved rationality. Uh, well, I, I think rationality would be extremely useful for for evolutionary reasons. But m my argument is, isn't specifically about how we could get rationality from evolution. It's more like, could the specificity and accuracy of math have occurred in the same way the specificity and accuracy of wings occurred in that there was a spectrum of possibilities that that came about good a lot of bad math some really good ones that were slightly more accurate and if we progressively weed out the less accurate maths then that would seem to lead us to an extremely accurate math that describes reality and i don't and i think that we could get uh, the level of specificity that you're talking about in mathematics via this method without having to require some kind of transcendental connection to to some kind of supreme logic or something. If we just started with a, a derivative math, derivative rationality, and created a whole bunch of different iterations, many of which are just terrible, but we weeded out the bad ones, it seems that could lead us to an extremely precise mathematics in the same way that evolution could lead to a very precise set of wings or something. And so if we applied this kind of rationale to the progress of mathematics, that would explain why it so well corresponds with reality without the need of some kind of transcendental connection to something. 
Okay. I mean, that's, that's a faith position. That may very well be the way it is, but it could also be the other way. <laughs> oh, well, sure, sure. So my question was, why do you think it's the other way? Is there any reason to think the other way is more rational than this way? That's kind of, because you said that you believe that yeah. this is a fact that indicates the conscious entity hypothesis. Yeah, because you can explain things or you can explain things away. And the idea that there is um, a, a transcendent reality to rationality itself seems to me, um, if not self-evident, something that occurs naturally to the human mind, just as the idea of causality leading us outside of the natural realm uh, occurs naturally to the, to the human mind. Um, and so you can choose that, and that gives you a pretty darn good picture of everything. And it grounds rationality for me in a way in which I can trust it um, completely. Because, and I don't mean completely in the sense that it gets everything right. I mean, it gets, it, it has inherent within it um, the desire to know and the desire to know reality, the truth, which for me is the search for God, the search for meaning, the search for value. Um, and all of those themes, things seem grounded to me in that reality. And ultimately, for me, what the choice came down to um, at, at the point when I came back to, to theism, after I'd left atheism, or, or in the process of leaving atheism, was a question of value. And, and if value, and you, you mentioned Lawrence Krauss, and I was going to say at the time, don't pick on Lawrence, he's one of my favorites. I really like Lawrence Krauss. <laughs> um, but um, if, if everything is indeed Go away. just this, these epiphenomenal things, then we lose absolute value. We lose absolute truth. And all we can pursue is this sort of mishmash that, that we're constructing from our minds and sort of interacting with the world and trying to make sense. But is there any real connection between them? And I mean, if it's just an evolutionary mechanism that's not in any way guided, that, that has no transcendent reality in a rational structure, then it, it falls apart for me. So, so you mentioned a few things there. Um, one was that it was self-evident and occurs naturally in the human mind. Like that does not seem like a reasonable basis we should go off of because lots of things are, there's tens of thousands of fallacies, biases, illusions, delusions, misconceptions, um, hallucinations that are all self-evidently true that happen in human minds all the time. And so that seems like the fact that it's naturally occurring in the human mind is not a reasonable basis to take something seriously. And then you mentioned the desire to know, um, like the desire to know something is kind of like the desire for me to have a billion dollars in my bank account. The fact that I have a desire for such a thing does not indicate the truth of the thing is more likely. So I don't think the desire right. to know is, is more reliable. And then you said we lose absolute value and truth. I'm not sure why we would lose that. Cause like, even if math is constructed by the brain, um, that doesn't mean it can't correspond to reality. So even if it's just unguided and random, say there's a random dice or something, say if I Why asked- should I trust it? Well, well, that's a different question. So the, the question is, is, is there absolute truth? And epistemically, why should we trust it? Like if I just took a bunch of dice and just rolled them, it could land on 3.14159265353, et cetera, et cetera, and get pi perfect. Um, now, so there could be an absolutely true correspondence to the numbers that are generated randomly and reality, whether or not we realize it. So even if our evolutionary processes were random, that wouldn't mean absolute truth is impossible or absolute value is impossible. It would just mean that the correspondence may not necessarily be determined. And so we wouldn't lose absolute truth. What we would question is the epistemic justification, which was your next question. And I think that you can be epistemically justified via evolution because i think it does select for truth i think truth is evolutionarily advantageous and if but it truth is doesn't evolu even exist you i mean you just truth truth doesn't exist it's it's just a construction of the mind well so when i say absolute truth what i mean is that there is a factual correspondence to a sentence and reality 
So I, I agree truth is a property of sentences that is constructed, but it can be true that this sentence corresponds to reality and that can be an objective truth. Um, and so you can have that even if the constructed way in which language and truth was formed to describe language was a product of evolution or random or whatever, that can still be justified in corresponding to reality. Um, and so I don't see why we would lose a objective correspondence to reality, even if language evolved from evolutionary processes. I don't understand that argument because it seems like like even if we just built a random calculator or something and the random calculator just randomly generated random numbers, but the false ones were selectively taken out of that by some mechanism, that would mean eventually the conclusions by the calculator would be justified um, knowledge. It would be objective truth um, if there was some mechanism to filter out the false ones. And it doesn't need to be the case that the calculator was designed to work accurately. It could just be random. As long as the false ones were periodically removed, it could still have an absolute correspondence to reality. False and true to whom? Correspondence to reality. Yep, but false and true to whom? It's always to some rational observer. Well, so in this, I'm using a calculator. So a calculator... You lose truth because there is no truth unless there's someone to see the truth and falsity of something. Well, I'm not quite following that. So like, say there's a calculator, no conscious agents, just a calculator, and it randomly generates numbers. And say there's some mechanism that uh, deletes that. deletes the false numbers, also not conscious. So no consciousness in the calculator, no consciousness in the, in the mechanism that removes the false numbers. Um, and eventually the numbers that are generated by the calculator will be more accurate and correspond to reality more likely and so if you were a rational agent looking at the calculator you'd be justified in believing the calculator right if you were a just a, a rational agent so it's sure. always it's always rational it's it, i mean it's always true or false to an individual to someone that's i mean that's the fundamental um insight of, of phenomenology right edmund husserl that all, consciousness is always conscious of something so if truth can only exist if someone is conscious of it, yeah. then without consciousness, we lose truth. Sure. But so without rationality, was, is... we lose truth. And if rationality is merely an epiphenomenon that has developed, and it, there's no way of even really knowing if truth exists in any sense, so we lose absolute truth because there is no such thing as absolute truth in a purely material universe in which there is no conscious structure, no transcendent being to whom things are conscious. So I lost the connection between three or four of those those statements there. One is, so imagine we have the calculator and our consciousness is looking at the calculator. The calculator generates random numbers. The false numbers are eliminated by some other natural mechanism. Now, all of this is, is contingent. There's no necessary connection to the fundamental nature of reality here, none whatsoever. It just happens to be the case that it works. Now, I would be rationally justified in believing the calculator because there is this natural mechanism, which is contingent, natural selection is what it is. Um, and it doesn't, it's not determined by fundamental nature of reality. It just happens to weed out the bad ones and accept the good ones. And if this is the case, I would be rationally justified in believing the objective truth of the calculator, even though nothing in the calculator, nothing in the mechanism, and nothing in my mind have any fundamental connection to this essence of truth rationality thing. Just, yes. I don't need any of that. Yes. I have no problem with all that. I agree with everything you said there. I have no problem with that. What I'm trying to, to say is let's look at the broader structure because you're saying what? It has zeroed in on truth completely um, randomly. Okay. Yes. But what is the truth that it's zeroed in on? It can only be something that is being observed by a rational being. Well, that's the part so I don't truth, think I understand here. Truth does not exist if there isn't an observer, a rational observer, noting the correspondence between reality and the, the truth that it's seeing. Sure, sure. But facts exist independent of truth. Facts are there regardless of whether truth is there. And so if How? you want... What is what is a fact independent table, of tables. independent of a rational observer? Uh, a thing that exists. 
Okay, so we're back to that fundamental thing of, of taking the, the position, the starting with the position that reality is just the, the, this, this is eternal existence, eternally existent thing. Um, but that's not truth because the eternally existent thing, if it has no, if it has no rationality, if it has no um, ability to observe, then truth is gone. Well, right. That's the point. The point, the question was, is can facts exist without truth? And well, yes. So a fact. But it's not a suppose, fact then either. Because a yes. fact can only be some, can only be a fact to a rational creature, a rational no. observer. No, a fact, a fact is a proposition that describes reality independent but of. A proposition observer. to whom? <laughs> well, that, that part doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It does matter. No. Because there are no propositions without a, a, an observer. It's a hypothetical without a imperative. rational being. It's a hypothetical imperative. So if a if a rational being could construct a conceptual model, a language or whatever, would that be true? Yes. Does that need to exist? No. So a proposition is a thing which if a rational being could construct this would be true, but it doesn't need to be there. So the rational being is irrelevant to the truth of a proposition uh, or a proposition or a fact existing. So say, and this isn't uh, claiming um, metaphysical naturalism. So it's just logical possibility. Is it logically possible that a table could exist with no minds to observe it. Yes, that is logically possible. There's no logical contradiction there. In which case, the, there is a fact that the table exists. There is no truth to any sentences because there's no sentences in this universe. There's no minds. And so there's no truth. But the fact exists just fine. No, I don't see why that would be a contradiction I, I don't, or a problem. I don't understand why... I, I don't understand why this is difficult. There are no facts because a fact is something to a rational creature. It's not something independent. There, well, I think we're defining what, facts. What in the world? What in the world is a fact that is not acknowledged as a fact by a rational being? Well, there's lots of those, like the number of grains of sand on Alpha Centauri. That that's a fact. It's not granted, not acknowledged by any conscious agents, but it's a fact. What what then? Then you get into the question of what is a grain of sand? How do you cut it out? How do you chop that up? Is a grain of sand this size, this size, this size? And and you get into this infinite complexity. A fact is something that has been constrained by a rational creature, and constrained in a particular metaphysical box. Well, I don't think that part, that's just definitional parts. And that part isn't irrelevant to the fact. Like facts are statements of existence. They don't, the, the, the interpretation, the of existence? interpretations is irrelevant. You don't make any, no one minds. Minds are irrelevant. You make no minds. A fact I mean, that's, is just. That's nice. That's nice as an assumption, but it doesn't well, no, work not, in not the even world in which assumption. we live. It's not, no. it's not even an assumption here. It's just a logical possibility. So there, it could be the case that a we are logical we're possibility to whom <laughs> to us right now. So, okay. so we are making, we are making conceptual models and in our conceptual models, here is a conceptual model where all that exists is material things and no minds. And there's a table and there's, there's a fact in this universe, but there are no statements. There are no sentences. There are no minds. There are no truths, but the table can exist just fine. And so us using our logical capabilities can infer the possibility of this universe in which there are facts but no truth statements sure. in which case that's perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with this universe it works perfectly conceptually well and this way could actually be the way our actual world works in fact that is mm -hmm. the consensus of science and philosophers most of them that this is the way the world works and so of the argument or the the position that there is a more fundamental consciousness we would need some kind of a strong reason to show that this model I've constructed is false because this model seems to work very, very well, that there are facts. You don't need truth for these. You don't need consciousness for these facts. They exist perfectly fine on their own. Um, objects are the core essence of reality. And in which case you can have facts to describe those objects, which could then be turned into truth statements by conscious agents, but you don't need the conscious agents for any of this. And if you're inferring that you need a consciousness to do this, then you would have to show that there's some problem with this model, which I don't think you presented yet. No, Here, here's, here's the thing. You're making this assumption in your mind about the logical universe that you're constructing, but you're still a rational agent doing it. So the very existence of this structure is what atheists always tell me we do with God. We create this thing in our minds and then we project it as real. 
But that's not allowing reality to correct our rational structures. I don't understand. So, so, cause my claim is that you are making, you hold the burden of proof cause you're claiming that consciousness is fundamental. And I'm saying, yeah, well, maybe it's not. And what is your reason for that? And then you're saying, well, I've constructed a model. Well, well yeah. Cause all I'm doing is showing that you hold the burden of proof. I'm not actually well, making no, a claim no, here. You're, you're playing with a model in your mind and you're saying this could possibly be the case. Yes. And, and I'm saying, good. Yeah. That's a possibility. And if that's the possible, if that's the reality, then that destroys what I'm saying. But that's an if. Right. And the evidence against it is your mind is constructing it right now. The whole yeah. idea of this reality that you've just constructed was constructed by a rational agent and then projected into the universe as a possibility because there's no possibility without a rational structure either. You're projecting it into the universe as a possibility, and then you're saying it proves that that's logically possible, and now I've got to disprove it? That puts me in the atheist position that, I've, that atheists always say, oh, you're trying to get me to prove a, a universal negative. Well, no, it's more like if we say there's a box over there, the box is closed, and you say that there is a little cat in the box. I'm like, why not think it's books? It could just be books, not a cat. I'm like, what's your evidence for thinking a cat? And then I'm looking for why, why, why do you think cat and not book? So, so I'm just giving you a possibility of an alternative and why would you prefer the cat and not the book? And I don't yeah, see the I, reason I, I, to prefer I, I the cat. Can very clearly, I can tell you why I prefer, why I prefer the God or, or the rationality is because rationality seems incredibly important to me. I value it incredibly. I value the, the products of science. I invite, I value this, the uh, investigations of science. I value the, the conclusions of science. And I also value all the things that rationality, human rationality has given us, all of the literature, poetry, um, uh, the humanities, all of these things, the history that we have to study are incredibly valuable to me. And what preserves them is the opposite view, that rationality is fundamental. I mean, that's that ultimately is what, what lay at the decision when when I took the step back from atheism to theism, because it, it was it was not a choice purely of rationality, because at the point when I got there, it was like, here's one side, here's the other side, both are rational visions. So I can buy your vision, but I have to choose it metaphysically, or I can buy the vision that preserves the rational structure, preserves the value of the rational structure, and all of the other things that come with human existence. And I said, boy, I like this a little better. So I don't, I don't quite get that. Cause like I value Instagram models quite a bit, but I don't think that because I value Instagram models that I would be rational to infer Instagram models are fundamental to reality. So I don't understand the connection between you valuing the rationality there and for inferring that it's fundamental. <laughs> one side or the other is true right either your side is true or the side that i'm claiming looks better is to me is true and i say "Ooh, i like this but either side's a rational p p point i mean i'm trying to i'm trying to say that to you i found atheism rational and in fact it's hyper rational but it didn't let me to access the values, because those values became epiphenomenal, which is kind of what we've been talking about all along through this. Um, the, the, the distinction between the epiphenomenality, epiphenomenality of, of rationality and the reality of rationality. And I'm saying rationality is, and as you said, this was, this was your word, and I like it actually, that, real, that, that rationality is fundamental. I, I like that. That's a good way to say it. Um, versus it isn't. And yeah, I prefer the model where it is. Because uh, without it, you couldn't access the values. I think that's that what you said, right? It grounds the values. I wouldn't say you can't access them. As an atheist, I had a pretty full life. I enjoyed, I still right. enjoyed the same things that I'm enjoying now. Um, but these, it grounds it better on the other side. Could you explain what you mean when you say it grounds the values better? Yeah, because it if 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 the structure 
of my rational existence is purely epiphenomenal, then it's possible I'm living in a matrix. And I can't really trust the things that are going around on around me. And that there is indeed, as Descartes said, an evil genie who is always in the process of deceiving me and not letting me find reality. I prefer a reality in which what I'm doing leads me to actually discover truth and love and, 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 and the values of you know, a liberal education. Um, those things have always been incredibly important to me. And of course, as a philosopher, you know this too, this stuff is so much fun that I would like for it to be real <laughs> and not just, not just an epiphenomenon. So, so how does, suppose we take the matrix hypothesis. I like that example. I'm a fan of the movie. Great movie. Um, Me too. I liked all uh, of them actually. Yeah. Uh, so we have, you're saying that in the natural hypothesis, you can't rule out the possibility we're in a matrix, but I don't see how that's any different in the God hypothesis. It seems to me that if there's a God as the fundamental nature, or if there's nature as the fundamental nature, both have an equal possibility of giving us true information and false information, whether we're in the yep. matrix or an accurate description of reality. I agree. Until, wasn't your until in, in the study of God, we come to understand that this fundamental reality is also rational and good. And I, and I know I'm making Descartes' point here, but if, if, that, if that is the reality, and I choose to believe that that is the reality, then he's not leading me astray when I look around and I look across the room over there and I see my wife over there. It's not an illusion. It's not an epiphenomenon. It's really her. And I really, really do love her. And that love is not something that's just a product of the metaphysic, uh, I mean, excuse me, of the physical reality around me. It's not just fire, uh, neurons firing in my mind, but that there's a reality to love outside of this, this existence, this veil of tears, if you will. Um, and I find that much more appealing than the idea that we are simply mechanistic things um, that are only sort of epiphenomenally manifesting the the things inherent in nature or, or, or in the material world. I, why would it make a difference what love was made of? So let's say love was made of just matter and motion or neurons or whatever. Why would that make it any less real than if it was uh, this other kind of thing you're talking about? Right. So speaking of the matrix, right? The, um, the one character in, in there talked about um, the, uh, talked about the uh, um, how much he enjoyed being in the matrix. Um, and he preferred going back to the delusion rather than to uh, to live um, in this world that is so harsh. I, well that yes. for, yeah for, for me as an atheist, that was exactly expressing my position as an atheist. It's like I want the truth and I don't care what it does. You know, if it tears away all of these things and it makes the world um, much less rich, much less valuable, then so be it. That's worth the price because it's giving me truth. But when I began to see that truth itself was something I was losing by holding on to that, that everything was epiphenomenal and that there was nothing of substance beyond this, this illusory world in which I was living. That was a price too, too steep to pay. So are you Cypher in this analogy or? <laughs> is, is That was the name Cypher? Yeah. Yep. Cypher, yeah. the bald so, guy with the goatee. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, I, I brought the analogy up and I thought, well, this might work against me, but we'll give it our best shot. <laughs> so yeah, at one level, um, uh, if, if, if I've got these two possibilities to live in and, and the only way, uh, there's no way of knowing which one for sure is the right answer, then why not choose the one that, that anchors everything and makes it seem really worthwhile 
to to have um, rather than the uh, the the dark dark truth. Well, so, so I think my question was slightly different than there. I'm saying that there's. I want to go with the light truth, the happy truth that there is an objective love and meaning kind of a thing. So let's just say mm -hmm. that there is an objective love kind of meaning thing. Why would the fact that love was made of neurons make it less real or less good than the kind that's not made of neurons? So at this point, I'm not saying it's just like um, the matrix where it's a fake reality. I'm saying why can't love be real and objective and be made of neurons? Um, I think I, because I don't think, I don't think neurons, um, the, the it, love would definitely be on that view, an epiphenomenon. In other words, it's not based in reality. So again, we go back to the question of, is, is there something real beyond, um, beyond this, this basic level of material reality, um, or isn't there? And wait, could, could you go back for a second? You said you said sure. that it wouldn't be based in reality. And that's the part I think I'm missing. Cause like I think that things can be real and be composites. So like I have a I have a car. I think my car is real and it's a composite of other things. I don't think the fact that it's a composite makes it less real. Because it seems to be like what you're implying is that for something to be real, it has to be fundamental. And if it's not fundamental and if it's a composite, then it's not real. No. No, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you let me to let me clarify that. That's definitely not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that because it's composite, it's not real. Um, an epiphenomenon is not necessarily a composite. It's something that is that is stepping away from the fundamental reality. So it's not real in the sense that it's okay. It's not real in the sense that it it's not based in. The fundamental reality it is a mere secondary um secondary result of it wait say that again because that sounds like you're saying if it's a composite Sorry, i'm gonna move up here i'm sliding down in my chair <laughs> <laughs> gotta get one of my chairs get one of these big these big things. <laughs> but so so you said uh to say that it's an epiphenomenon means it's sliding away from the fundamental nature and I'm not sure what you mean by sliding away in this context. Cause if like, if the fundamental nature is physical, then love could be a composite of the physical stuff and it would be equally as real as if it was a spiritual kind of a thing. Right. And so like, if it's made of the fundamental nature of reality, which if in my worldview is matter, then the fact that it's a composite wouldn't mean it's not real or it's epiphenomenal. It is a real thing. Cause I take identitarianism, which is that, conscious states are synonymous with the physical states that embody them. And so from my position, love is objectively real and it is a feature of the fundamental nature of reality, even though it's just a composite of certain physical features. And so my question is, is why would love be more real in a spiritual world where love is made of the spiritual stuff, as opposed to in a material world where love is made of the material stuff? Because they're both in each worldview tied into the fundamental nature of reality. And so I don't see why in one worldview, you would lose the objective value and meaning because I think you would have them equally in both. But meaning is meaning. Here we go back to this again. Meaning is meaning to a conscious being. And conscious beings are derivatives, secondary phenomena um, resulting from matter. Um, and matter is the fundamental reality. And so the derivative thing is less real than the, the fundamental reality underlaying it. Um, and that's, as I said, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But I don't think, I don't think that value, which is what love is, um, is, is a secondary, is, is a secondary reality or even a composite reality. I think that value for human beings, for conscious human beings, is fundamental. I think what we encounter in the world is not material reality, but values. If everything that we see around us is a valued thing at some level. Um, and if value, value seems more real to me than does matter.
at least for a conscious being, because matter, I'm not sure how to say that. L let me stop there. I mean, All right. for, for a conscious being, when I look at the world around me, I mean, if I don't know, I don't know, you, you seem to have a really good background in, in philosophy. And that's fantastic, because that matches us up pretty well. Although I don't consider myself particularly brilliant in philosophical speculation, or in even knowing the history of philosophy. But um, psychology, in recent years has come up with the notion of affordances. And that's the idea that what we are encountering in the world um, is not material reality, but values. So we are as conscious beings grasping the world through a value structure, an implicit value structure. Um, and matter becomes secondary on that view. And it seems a pretty good way of looking at things to me. To me, that sounds like, um, like if I look at a galaxy, I have to look at the galaxy through a telescope because I can't see it. Um, but then to infer that telescope is fundamental and that the galaxy is made of the telescope seems to be like uh the incorrect inference that because we look at things a certain way epistemically therefore that epistemological means must be entailed in the ontology seems like a spurious conclusion okay so we look at you things lost, through our minds which has you. values yeah so so we look at things through our minds and we use value to interpret reality does that mean values are intrinsic to reality? I would say no. Just like if I'm looking at a galaxy through a telescope, does that mean the telescope is intrinsic in the galaxy? Well, no, it's just a means to access that thing. Okay. Uh, um, I'm not sure we're saying exactly the same thing. I'm saying as we, we, we look at the galaxy, we are valuing the galaxy first before we're seeing it as a galaxy. It is, it is the value that we see. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that the value that the galaxy doesn't exist. I'm saying that we are aware of it through a value structure first. And that, 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 that is, um, that, that is fundamental to our perception of the world. Um, right. and that is what it means to be a conscious being. And therefore, to parse the world up into the various facts and things, and that kind of gets us back to the, the issue of the grains of sand on Venus or whatever it was you said, um, it takes us back to um, the, how the conscious is, how the conscious interacts with the world around us and carves it up into the various um, epistemological categories that we have. Um, it, it, it's, it seems as though consciousness itself is fundamental to that process and that's, so that's I, I think that's sort of explaining what what i was talking maybe a little better maybe a little worse i hope i'm not getting less clear as we move forward but that seems to me why um it, we we can't really um process the world around us into these bare facts that you were talking about unless there is a, a person a, a consciousness to whom they are facts. Right. So I think, I think I'm getting you. So it would be like value is a lens that the mind needs in order to see the external world. And likewise, I would need a telescope to see other galaxies. Now without the telescope, I cannot see other galaxies. Like without the value, I cannot see the external world because I need the value as a lens to see those external things. But does that mean that the value is intrinsic to reality? Well, I don't think so. Just like I would say that the telescope isn't intrinsic to other galaxies just because I need one to see the other galaxies doesn't give me a reason to infer the telescope is intrinsic to the other galaxies existence. Just like how I need the lens of values to see external things doesn't give me an answer or a reason to infer that value is intrinsic in those other things existence. It just seems like it's a lens that is required epistemically, but it doesn't tell me ontologically that it's actually the fundamental thing. Okay, so I'm trying to trying to process everything you're saying. There is no 
there is no interaction with the world outside of conscious interaction with the world. So there are no facts unless they are facts to a consciousness. That's my position. Your position is that the material reality is what everything else is constructed from. And it still seems to me that you're abstracting from reality to get to the notion of things outside of a conscious structure. Because if there's no one conscious of the world, then there is no world. Well, so, so it means that, like, to me, that sounds like without a telescope, I can't see other galaxies. Hmm. Therefore, if there is no telescope, there are no other galaxies. Um, and so and that's that's exactly right, because what is a galaxy? A galaxy is a construct that we have put together. There is just the reality. So there's no such thing as another galaxy, because a galaxy, as you made the point before, is a linguistic concept that we've put together. So it's it's not a galaxy. It is. It may be there, whatever it is, but it still doesn't even make sense to say it's, that it's being there without someone that it's being there for. So I think I understand your position, but I think I would fundamentally disagree. I think that the words we use galaxy that. is to refer to an object which may or may not accurately correspond to the object. And that object is there independent of our words and independent of our means to access that object. And so I don't think that the existence of the galaxy is contingent on the telescope. I don't think it's contingent on the consciousness. I don't think it's contingent on the definition of galaxy. I think all of those are um, contingent, um, non-fundamental things that we use to interpret it, but don't matter to the galaxy. I don't think the galaxy cares. Yeah, but it's not a galaxy. <laughs> well, it can't we haven't be gone... a galaxy unless it's a galaxy to someone. <laughs> I think that's the part where we would disagree, but <laughs> we have been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. We have some questions from the audience, if you don't mind. No, that sounds good. All right. Nitty asks, uh, what is a rational person? Oh, these are questions to me? Yes, yes. Uh, my audience. Uh, are are, are all of the following me, but, questions to me? Um, some of them were for me. Um, okay. Very few of them. Normally, they're mostly for you. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm I'm a, a rational person. I, I don't think there are any irrational people in the sense that human beings are created as rational. Now that capacity to use rationality that we have can be misused. We can misuse logic. We can, we can come to irrational conclusions, but that's because we're using the software on the computer improperly. Gotcha. So you define any person as rational? Just a rational I, person is any person? I, I well, yeah is someone who is not functioning rational? Um, I don't know. I, you know, it, it, when consciousness blinks out and I've, I've lost consciousness a few times in my life, right. And I've, I've, I've seen it narrow down to this tiny little point that I can only, you know, just hope to survive from. And then I've come back from that. Um, am I rational at the point when consciousness blinks out? Yeah, I guess not. Um, so I, I'm not sure, but yeah, I would say that human beings are are fundamentally rational creatures that can misuse their rationality. Gotcha. I think I would define a rational agent as one that can get their beliefs to correspond to reality or have rational justification, justification, something like that. Um, next question is... JJ asks, are you content with the God of the Gaps? So I think he's asking, like, he interprets your argument to be something similar to a God of the Gaps, and would you be fine with that if it, your argument was a God of the Gaps? Okay, so I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but let me try this. I, um, I think the God of the Gaps argument goes fundamentally wrong because it seems to say that when we've explained something and taken it away from the realm of the theological, we have, you know succeeded in in making the point that god is no longer necessary and that slowly but surely we're diminishing the need for god in the world um, i think that's fundamentally flawed because 
what science has done, the more we've discovered, has increased the mystery rather than reduced it. Um, I, I don't know about you, but finding out that there are such things as black holes and quasars and, um, and quantum entanglement has made the world far more mysterious than it has um, sort of reduced the mystery and taken away the realm of God. Um, and so the mystery gets deeper and deeper the more we discover, just as we would expect it to for an infinite creator. Gotcha. Um, Max Rose asks, if we can call what we know to be fundamental now God, what if we discover something more fundamental? <laughs> Do you want my answer on that? Yeah. So I think he's asking like... <laughs> because the, there, there is nothing more fundamental than God. I mean, if, the, if we find something more fundamental, then that would be God. Okay. Um, Janice asks, where did God come from? Again, by definition, he came from nowhere. He is the eternal existence. And that's no more irrational than what, what Tom said at the beginning of our discussion about everything existing forever, right? The eternal, the eternal material world. And, and I'm sorry, I hope I'm not misquoting you there, Tom. Oh, no. So, yeah, I definitely think that there is an eternal material world, but I don't think, I think that the the things that you claim are fundamental can only be rational if we all don't have evidence of them being composite. So, like, I couldn't say it's a pineapple. I think that would be irrational. And that's why I also think it couldn't be a mine because we don't have any evidence that mines can exist without being composites, just like pineapples. As far as the quantum fields, we don't have any evidence they're composites. And so they're more rational to believe are the fundamental thing or something along those lines. Um, Eves asks, where did God get the ingredients for his first creation? Ex nihilo. Something from nothing? Something from nothing, but God is everything. So there, you know, if, if, if you're requiring, this is the sort of question that, you know, is part of the mystery. I don't know. Gotcha. Uh, Nitty asks, I think this was a question for me. Most of us can't conceive of a non-locally real universe. Is that rational? Um, I think it's possible using quantum logic to be rational, but using standard logic, probably not. Ooh, that's an interesting, what's quantum logic? Um, there's non-standard logics in philosophy that use, yeah, well, um, okay. like, reject the law of the excluded middle or something and quantum logic is kind of a variation on that where it says that yep. their truth conditions can be both true and false at the same time so that's hegel too okay yeah I, I i know about those i thought there was something specifically about quantum logic that i hadn't heard of okay thank you for that gotcha. yep um how did he go from atheist to christian thank you melody for the joy for the thank you melody for the super chat it's melody joy is your name uh, how did he go from atheist to christian why not deism deism in deism so why did you convert to a christian rather than a deist i think is the question oh okay yeah it's um it, it's a matter of again the progression of the logic um so uh i grew up in a christian culture right and uh i then i left it for atheism and uh when i came back to theism um christianity became I, I, from everything i've been i've been teaching philosophy for 25 years as an atheist and so much of what i was teaching especially um plato and uh, plato aristotle and socrates uh kept pointing me back to to christ and the, the Christian story. And so when I came back, it was initially to a theist position. And I struggled for, I don't know, maybe a day or so, maybe a week or so, maybe a month or so, I'm not sure exactly the time period, before it collapsed back into Christianity. But I tell the story, if you want to hear it, on the Christian Atheist podcast. Uh, and it's at like an eight-part series in the very beginning of the podcast. So if you're interested in hearing the story, and I try to give a pretty good narrative as best as I could at the time, back in 2019 when I was starting to put it together, uh, of the odyssey, the change uh, over the, the course of those 25 years, 
as the cracks appeared in the dam and eventually burst in 2019. Um, so go to the Christian Atheist podcast, listen there to the first eight. And if you're intrigued, listen to the rest up to like 86. Where are we now? Yeah, we're almost to 90. Awesome. Uh, I actually just broke, I think, 900 on my channel for conversations. Uh, 900? I'm not sure what that means. 900 interviews. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I've been full-time for five years now, so. Well, I just, I want to say thank you for not combing your hair while we, <laughs> while we. <laughs> had our I like chat. combing my hair. It's it's nice. It feels <laughs> good. <It's> not... <laughs> my my wife used to, usually has to let me know when my hair is bad because I never look at myself in the mirror. I don't want to see. <laughs> um. So good question asks, if knowledge requires verification against reality, he does not have knowledge of God. Oh, well, verification is, of course, always only partial. But I think I've gotten pretty good verification as I've lived ever since 2019 and some before that. I mean, when, when I was first a Christian, it worked a little bit. And when I walked away, I was glad I walked away. And after I've come back, it's been ever more clear. So I've had lots of verification. I haven't had uh, verification used in the soft sense there. I haven't had proof. I still would not tell you that I know there's a God. I believe there is one. Gotcha. All right. Um, Birdie Num Nuts asks, define consciousness. Can AI become conscious? I, I would revert to the Kantian point there um, and say, well, we can conceive of it, but until we actually encounter it and our, our concept matches the reality, um, we don't know. Uh, and, and so if we encounter an AI that becomes conscious, um, I would be very skeptical at first, and I would try as best I could to determine if in, that, if in fact all of the evidence is pointing that way. And if it were, I would probably be on the side of, wait a second, we've got another conscious existence here. And I would be, actually, that'd be kind of fun because I would love to see, um, I'd love to explore um, an artificial consciousness. For sure. I think that is going to be the next major um, progress in human technological growth is AI. And I think it's a really interesting question that I usually ask um, people is when we get AI, do you think it'll be an atheist or a theist based on the evidence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that will be an interesting question. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim asked, this was a question for me. What are the feathers of math? So like this was back with my evolution analogy that um, math could be the success of math could be explained in the same way as the success of evolution. And so the feathers of math would be the successful usages of math to describe quantum mechanics prior to us knowing about quantum mechanics or physics or anything like that. So the success of math would be different relations in math um, that are applicable to things that we hadn't discovered yet, just like how wings could be applicable to flights before they, were, they weren't they were evolved for flight. That would be the, the feathers of math. Um, Mr. Creening asks if he's going to invoke the observer effect dependency, then only consciousness that we have evidence for is our own. Solipsism. Yes. The problem of solipsism, except, um, I, I mean, sorry, I'm an existentialist and I'm a Sartrean existentialist in a lot of ways. And Sartre in, in his analysis of what he called his phenomenological ontology made the other a fundamental structure of consciousness. Um, and he, 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 did, he engaged in what I called the, the hermeneutics of inclusion. And as he examined the conscious structures, he essentially collapsed all of human, all of human, uh, all the human structures, structures of human consciousness down into this sudden eruption, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N, eruption of consciousness into the world. I hope that addresses gotcha. it. Gotcha. Um, no, it's not a comment. Um, thank you for the super chats. 
Harry. Harry asks, couldn't God make Eve more intelligent? Couldn't God have made Eve more intelligent? I don't know. My, my wife's far more intelligent than I am. So I think it's maybe part of the structure of reality that women just exceed men. Gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. I know that's flippant. I just, <laughs> uh, I guess I, I don't know what God can and can't do. <laughs> Flip it. Flippant comments are perfectly fine. They get more attention and views anyway. So I'm totally fine, <laughs> fine with that. Make fun of all the people in the chat. It'll make them angry and they'll send even more super chats to yell back at you. So I will appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Thank you for the super chat. What is the mechanism of a disembodied consciousness? We know how to tweak a consciousness with psychotropics. Yep. I have no idea. Part of the mystery. Gotcha. Uh, Geo Sam asked a flippant comment back. How many personal relationships does John have with beings he can't demonstrate to anyone? How many... Personal relationships. So like Personal your wife, you could you can I could you could introduce me to your wife so you can demonstrate she exists, but to a <laughs> god you couldn't do that. And so that's that's the impetus of the question. <laughs> I mean I, I'm not even sure how to respond to that. Um let's see. I think I think he's asking that it's unrational to believe in people who you can't demonstrate exist to others. Mm, Something like that. Okay, that's fair. Um when I think of my relationship with the Christ, um, I have a great deal of common, um, you know, acquaintances who also have that experience. And so I don't find it difficult at all. Lots of people share that, that, that acquaintance. And it is an acquaintance, right? Because it's a faith relationship. It's not the same as a human relationship. I mean, I can, I can encapsulate pretty well my, my relationship with my wife, but I live with her 24 seven and, uh, you know, I know her and have know her in that way, but she's a finite being too. Um, whereas the others, uh, you know, the God relationship, the Christ relationship, um, is not finite. It's, it's in, it's finite to infinite. And so, um, one would expect that one could not uh, do it at the same level, right? I can't, I can't introduce you to God in the same way I can introduce you to my wife because my wife is here in a different sense than God is. Gotcha. Um, so this is the solipsism question again. You know, you only have experience of the existence of your own consciousness. Why invent an external supernatural one to fill the role in your life? The creator of the universe. I, I'm, I'm not a solipsist. I do not believe that I am limited to, to my, um, to my consciousness. I believe that when I look out at the world around me, I'm actually encountering being, um, I, I can't, uh, that's part of the mystery. I mean, really as a, as, Kant tried to explain it. We've, we've tried throughout our entire history. What is it to relate to being? Uh, I don't know, but I think there's something very direct about our relationship to being. I think when I encounter the world, it's, it's a real encounter with being. When I pick up a spoon, it's really encounter. I'm really encountering a spoon and using it to spoon, not cereal, Tom, but but um, ramen into ramen. my mouth, right? <laughs> so I, I think we are actually encountering real individuals and things in our everyday life. Gotcha. Um, Bob Leach asked, what is your positive evidence that Christianity is true? True. How, how, I mean, how, what, what evidence would Bob accept that it's true? Um, I mean, the best we can do, I, everything depends on the resurrection of Jesus. It happened or it didn't, right? So we have, and going, going to the binary logic of, of Aristotle, it either happened or it didn't. And the, the best we can do from this vantage point in history is look back and say, okay, what is the evidence for it? And if we don't take supernatural off the, off the table first, then we can build a case. Um, and I think it's a 
decently strong case. Maybe not ironclad, but I wouldn't expect it to be. If it were ironclad, then I'd be forced to believe it. And that would violate our freedom. Gotcha. All right. That's it for most of the questions. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. It was a great conversation. Do you want to give any links oh, or references where people can find out more about your work? Yeah. Um, the Christian Atheist is available every on every podcast platform you can find. We also have a YouTube channel. Um, how do I tell people to get to the YouTube channel? Usually it's yeah, just the uh, Christian Atheist. Gotcha. You can just look it up as the Christian Atheist, our YouTube channel. Uh, with John Wise, yeah. Um, yeah usually it's the uh, youtube.com slash the, the name of your channel is usually the correct thing. Okay, perfect. Um, and I also have uh, another podcast called um, Simple Gifts, in which I choose selections of important literature in the Western canon and read them aloud. One of my favorites here recently is Paradise Lost. I've read the entirety of it um, and with, with, without commentary. Yeah, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to indoctrinate. I'm not. I'm not preaching. There's nothing on the on the on the uh, podcast, but the uh, the the works themselves. Awesome. Uh, thanks again. Really appreciate it, and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thoroughly enjoyed it, Tom. Thanks for having me on.